Morning. Welcome to Open Door Church. My name is Ali. And uh, so this week started off with uh, Callie starting uh, her uh, new uh, rehab assignment at uh, BMC. She's no longer doing in-house. She's now uh, strong enough to where she can uh, leave the home and, and start rehab at uh, BMC, which is a great thing. And uh, so the, they were discussing about uh, getting some new equipment for her this week. And uh, so Lisa and I were debating what uh, type of equipment and um, with the physical therapist up there deciding that we needed a recumbent bike would be the next logical thing for Callie. Um, so uh, halfway through the week, um, I ex I, my lawyer dropped off the accident report for Callie, and I read that, and uh, that wasn't so great. And so I was uh, had a bunch of mixed emotions going through the week, and then Saturday, the uh, uh, a gentleman from town. Um, who wants to do business in town. He's an old Jewish fellow, nice guy, and he's been through this whole thing with us. He stops in from time to time to check up on Cali, and he drops off a donut or two while um, he's visiting. And uh, so when he's uh, doing all these things, uh, I overheard him speak to uh, one of my customers who was just so happened to be in there that day, that uh, he's not a man of prayer. He doesn't believe in it. And he comes to bowling from time to time with our guys um, as we bowl on Thursday nights. And at Thursday nights at 9 o'clock, our table prays religiously. Everyone at that table, we pray at 9 o'clock on Thursday nights. And if he's there, he joins us in prayer. And at the end of the prayer, his famous line is, don't forget the Jewish people. And um, through all of this, um, I think uh, God's been working with him a little bit. And for a man who doesn't believe in prayer showing up on a Thursday night, he knows it's coming. And he joins us um, without any say whatsoever. And I think he takes pleasure in it. So Saturday he calls me from Florida. He's away. And he was following Callie's story um, on Facebook through Lisa's post. And he saw that Callie was walking uh, on a treadmill. And he goes, well, we just redid our home. And I have a gym in there. And my wife and I decide we want to get rid of a recumbent bike. Would you like it? So uh, through all of this, uh, you know, it's a roller coaster ride. And that the Lord is always with you, no matter what you're doing. Um, even when you think he's um, taking a little break, he's always working, always providing, no matter what it is, no matter how small or how big. So uh, it was a pretty tough week for me. But uh, ended off, it ended off uh, with a nice little story there. So I'll be reading uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, lines 12 through 22. Christian conduct. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently, diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone, see that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another for all people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Please join me in prayer. Thank you, Father, for your good word every day. Thank you for continuing to bless this church and all those who are here today. We all struggle with one thing or another, Father, and may you continue to uh, bless those who are struggling. Um, Wednesday night's prayers, fathers, are is a big deal for us all, and may you continue to answer them all, Father, and help those uh, that are really in pain, Father, um, when it's a mental, physical, or spiritual pain, that you give them comfort and peace. And we love you, Father, and every day is a great day that you continue to strengthen all those that, uh, that are hurting inside and out. May you continue, Father, to show yourself to all those that could continue to push against you. And uh, may you, Father, help... Uh, 
our church, Father, to continue to grow and prosper. You are a great God, Father. Love you, and I thank you in the name of your Son. Amen. Amen.
Good morning. You know, one thing I've discovered, come on down, come on down. One thing I discovered is that you guys like it when I bring food, right? Whenever I brought bananas, I took them back there and put them for the fellowship time, and every one of those bananas were eaten. I brought grapes one time, you know what happened to them? People ate all my grapes, right? And I know you love to eat things that uh, I use for object lessons, so I brought some food today. Now, this is a different kind of food. This is wilderness food. How many of you think you'd like wilderness food? This is desert food. This is something that, that uh, somebody that we read about in the Bible, he ate this, and this was his food. And how many of you uh, would like to eat desert food, wilderness food? How many of you would be willing to try it? You don't trust me, do you? <laughs> Calvin says, no. All right. Well, I brought some wilderness food with me. And we'll see if you've ever had any of this. It's like my wilderness food kind of spilled out. What is that? Can you see what that is? What is that? Do you know you can eat that? Do you know there was a man in the Bible that by the name of John the Baptist and that's what he ate? What does that look like? Bugs. <laughs> Have you ever eaten any bugs? No. No. But those are that's a particular kind of bug. You know what kind of bug that is? You know what that is? You don't want to touch it, let alone eat it, right? In fact, I think I can probably put this back there for the fellowship time, and you won't have to hurry out of class. There'll still be some left for you by the time we're finished, okay? You think so? I think that the, probably the adults won't eat a lot of it, but maybe you want to sample it because you might want to see what John the Baptist ate while he was out in the wilderness, okay? The Bible says he lived on locust, or as we would know, as we would think of grasshoppers, and honey. Now you like honey, but locusts and grasshoppers, do you like that? No. I see them jumping in the grass and I've never thought, wow, that makes me hungry. <laughs> I never thought that. But you know, that's what he ate because grasshoppers are full of protein and it was good for him and he was out there. But you know what? He ate that because there were no grocery stores out there in the desert. There was no place for him to find food. He was out there by himself. And so he ate what was there. And why was he willing to do that? The reason he was willing to go out there and eat grasshoppers was because he was there because he wanted to spend time with God. And nobody was out there except him and God. You know that's a pretty special place to be. Any place where that you can spend time alone with God is a place that's pretty special. And so as you think about that, as you think about John the Baptist this morning, and you think about, oh my goodness, look what he had to eat. Now I bought these because they said they were barbecued grass, barbecue grasshoppers. And I kind of like barbecue. So I thought if they taste like barbecue, I could eat them. But I don't want you to eat any right now because what you need to do with these, I learned something. You have to eat a grasshopper with a cookie. Then it tastes all right. Okay? If you eat one with a cookie, it's better. Especially an Oreo. And you can put it right in the middle and it, it tastes a lot better that way. Okay? But remember, the reason he did that was because he wanted to be alone with God okay so we can find places to be alone with God and that's a very special thing so let's pray and thank God that he gave us something besides bugs to eat and thank God that he loves us the way he does so let's pray together father we thank you for your many mercies we thank you for the love that you do have for us I pray for each of these children and pray that, Lord, they would know that you love them individually, that you want them to spend time with you, that you want them to pray and talk with you and just to be alone with you sometimes. So I pray that they will learn that they are never alone, even though John the Baptist was out in the desert by himself. He was not by himself because you, dear God, were with him. And so, Lord, help us to remember that we're never alone and that you always take care of our needs. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All right.
Amen. You may be seated. Well, amen. It sounds like you're awake now after that short night of, of rest, but you're, you're with us now, so praise God for that. You know, aside from the person of Jesus Christ, possibly the most fascinating individual in all of the New Testament is a man that we know by the name of John, John the Baptist. As you read about him, very little is revealed about him in the Gospels, particularly about his life before he began his public ministry. You will find that standing between the account of his miraculous birth and his time in the desert, in that wilderness of Judea, there's one verse of Scripture. It's Luke chapter 1, verse 80, and it says of him, And the child continued to grow and to become strong in spirit. And he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel. I want us to look into Mark's gospel and his record of John the Baptist as he begins his journey, his journey through the life of Christ. In fact, he begins with these words in Mark chapter 1, verse 1. He says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God. The beginning of the Gospel. And where does He begin? Where does He begin with all that? Well, He begins with the story of Jesus by pointing to the ministry of John the Baptist. So how important was this man? That Mark would begin his Gospel by talking about him as he attempts to share the Gospel with us. Well, how important was he? Well, like Jesus, he was important enough that he was talked about in the Old Testament prophecies. We know that like Jesus, he was important enough that his conception was foretold by an angel of the Lord. We read about Isaac in the Old Testament, and we know that like Isaac, he was, that John the Baptist was born miraculously to a mother who had never been able to have children and is described by Luke along with her husband as being advanced in years. You know, Jesus even said of John the Baptist, he said, Truly, I say to you, among those born of women... There has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. It is unknown how long John's parents lived after his birth. But it was at least long enough for him to be able to care for himself. He was certainly beyond his teenage years, his younger teenage years, before he went to live in the desert. But I want you to know, he did not go there out of a sense of adventure. It wasn't something that he decided, well, my parents are deceased now. I have no one to care for me. I think I'll go off into the desert. I've always wanted to live in the desert. I've always wanted to be out there in the desert. There's something fascinating. It's a beautiful place out there in the desert. No, that wasn't what it was. John went into the wilderness in order that he might separate himself from society so that all of his direction would be from God. All of his teaching would come from heaven. Now John was what was called a Nazarite. As such, he was under a lifelong commitment to deny bodily desires and to establish a deep fellowship with God through an unworldly life. He was one who was told as a Nazarite that he had to not cut his hair. He had to let his hair grow and have it uncut. And he was to abstain from the fruit of the grape in every form. His life's work, as we read about him, is summarized in his message that is recorded in Mark chapter 1 and verse 3 where it says that he was to make ready for the way of the Lord. Make ready the way of the Lord. Now Malachi, the last Old Testament prophet, spoke very plainly concerning John the Baptist in his third chapter, the first verse, where he said, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And so the people of Israel were looking for this messenger. They were looking for this prophet. They were looking for this one who would come and appear on the scene before the Messiah would be revealed. 
Well, Mark draws our attention to that messenger as he begins to give us the good news of God the Son coming into the world to save us from our sins. Now, why does he start there? It is because John the Baptist was in a very real sense the bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament, between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. He was an example of Old Testament righteousness at its best. And he was the proclaimer of the one that Scripture says would fulfill all righteousness, the Lord Jesus Christ. You've heard of John the Baptist. Well, consider with me this messenger's mission. As we said already, his purpose was to prepare for the Messiah. It says in verse 2, As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. Now even though Mark appears to be attributing this quote to the prophet Isaiah, that's what it sounds like when you have that verse by itself, it is actually something, as you noticed, it was very similar to the verse I read from the book of Malachi. In fact, it is actually a quote from Malachi, but it was very common in writing to combine quotations, when you put two quotations, one after another, to combine the two as to the writer. We might simply say, well, the Scripture says, and then we'll quote a couple of verses that may not be connected in place, but they are connected in purpose. And so with this, what Mark is doing is he is bringing this verse in because the very next verse is going to be a quote for, that you can tie to the book of Isaiah. Since Isaiah was the greater of the two prophets, he just says, as you read, as is written in Isaiah, the prophet... You'll find that verse 3 is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Well, the context of this verse, if you can set that aside for a minute, the context of Malachi 3.1 was actually a threat. Because you see, the priest in Malachi's day were not attending to their duties. Sacrifices were made that did not meet the standards set out in Scripture, that being that the sacrifice had to be one without blemish. Because in general, they did not care that it didn't match up to Scripture. The messenger who was to come was to cleanse and purify the worship. And John, being the prophet who would be precede the anointed one, he was there that he might be able to declare to the Jewish people that they have fallen short of the Word of God. They have stopped short of what they need to be doing. In other words, John the Baptist prepared the way of the Lord by exposing the empty shell of religious practices in his day. He did that by preaching righteousness. Now folks, let me tell you something if you haven't been paying attention. We also live in a day when most Christians are satisfied with an empty shell of religious practices. I want to be religious. Just give me some way in which I can fit into a tradition. Give me some way in which I can have the outer part of that to where that I can feel myself to be a good person. Like the priest of Malachi's day, they are willing to go through the motions, but they are unconcerned about the details. You know that the religious philosophy in our day is don't sweat the small stuff. And you know when you have that attitude about the Word of God, you know what happens? Everything becomes small stuff. Things that are very well laid out in Scripture and things that seem to have been very important to Jesus, very important to the prophets, very important to the Word of God become something that people say, well, that is a minor issue. Let's ignore that. Everything seems to become small stuff in our day. And so when you say, this is what the Word of God says, people say, well, let's not get hung up on such things as that. Folks, the only way that we are going to be able to prepare the way of the Lord in our society so that the people around us might be able to come to the Lord Jesus Christ is to proclaim the uncompromised Word of God. You know that John's message was one of repentance. 
And in his day, that was very unpopular, especially among those who considered themselves to be very religious. Would you imagine that it's very unpopular even today? But let me ask you a question. What you know about John the Baptist, can you imagine him preaching a message of repentance and in closing it by saying, well, folks, that's at least my opinion. And if you have another opinion, it's just not worth fighting about. So let's just all join together, hold hands, and sing a verse of Shall We Gather Down at the River. The messenger's mission was preparation for the Messiah. Let me say again, that is our mission as well. We need to live in such a way that people around us might be able to see the Messiah, that they might be able to respond to the Messiah, and they will only do that as we stand on the concepts of righteousness, if we stand firmly upon God's truth. You see, it is our purpose that we prepare the people of Berkshire County to meet the Lord. And they will only do that if we live our faith. Notice, his mission was preparation for the Messiah, but it was also proclamation of the Messiah. For it says in verse 3, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now the original context of these words, as I said, are from Isaiah chapter 40, 40 verse 3, which was a promise that God was coming to deliver his people from their captivity in Babylon. His is a voice in the wilderness crying out to make ready for the coming of God. Now he was a voice in the wilderness both literally and figuratively. Speaking of the dryness of the religion and the religious people around him, but also being in that desert place. You know, in John chapter 1, verse 23, when a committee from the Sanhedrin came to ask, as, to ask John who he was, he used this very language to describe his ministry. He was only a voice crying in the wilderness, crying against society's moral barrenness. Just a voice. But that voice is still echoing through the corridors of the centuries. And what was his message? It was make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. In other words, return to righteousness. In other words, return to the ways of God because God is about to do something special in your midst. Can you imagine how much different it would have been if all of the twists and all of the turns which the religious leaders had put into the religious system were not there when Christ began his ministry? Can you imagine the difference in the reception they would have had of him? Can you imagine how much difference it would have been for him? Without the ministry of John the Baptist, well, the situation would have been much worse. Now, sometimes we think that we are the only voices crying out in the wilderness and that nobody is listening. It's just like we're out in the desert where there's nobody but the bugs, right? And we think, well, it doesn't matter because nobody is hearing what I have to say. Well, do not believe it. The messenger's mission was that he might proclaim the righteousness of God. Now I want you to notice the messenger's method. John's preaching was a preaching regarding something called baptism. It says in verse 4, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now we know as we study the Jewish life that symbolic washing and purifying was woven into the very fabric of their rituals. When a Gentile converted to Judaism and that they had provision for that. In fact, three things had to happen. Well, first was circumcision because that was a sign of Israel's covenant with God. Second was that a sacrifice had to be made for him because he stood in need of atonement and only blood could atone for sin. And so a sacrifice was made. And third, baptism, which symbolized his cleansing from all of the pollution of his past life he had to undergo. This person had to undergo baptism. By this way, and when I'm talking about baptism, I'm not talking about sprinkling with water, because that's not what they did. They fully immersed people into the water as we see water baptism today. 
it was a total submersion in water. You know, the amazing thing about John's baptism was that he was asking Jews to submit to that which only a Gentile was supposed to need. Because if you were born Jewish, you didn't have to go through all of this. You didn't have to be one that, that had to go through baptism because you were already part of the Jewish family. And so here he was declaring to them that they needed to submit to that which normally only the Gentiles who converted to Judaism had to submit to. But he was telling them there must be a repentance of sin from sin for you to have a personal relationship with God. Your religion's not enough. Now what a novel idea that was. And he preached to them repentance, turning away from their sin, turning back toward God. Folks, that hasn't changed. We still have to come to a place in our lives where we're willing to repent of sin, that we're willing to turn from our sin so that we can turn to Jesus. Now you can't simply say, well, I believe in Jesus. I've always believed in Jesus. Now what Scripture says, Scripture says you need to repent of your sin and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that needs to take place in order for you to be saved. I am sure that there were those in John's day who argued, you don't have to be baptized to repent. Would they have been right? Certainly they would have been. But John was calling upon them to demonstrate their repentance by yielding to baptism. Folks, there are many people today who say that baptism does not matter. After all, you don't have to be baptized to go to heaven, do you? Of course you don't. After all, the thief on the cross was never baptized, was he? Of course he wasn't. Of course, I would imagine if he'd been given the option, he'd have been glad to get down off that cross and go be baptized. That would have been, I'm sure that would have been fine with him. Folks, it is not necessary for you to be baptized in order to go to heaven. It is only necessary for you to be baptized if you want to be obedient to God. That's when it's necessary. So if baptism were not important, then why would Peter in his message on the day of Pentecost, when he responded to the question, what shall we do? Why would he say, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? Why was that important to Peter on that very first, that very first day of Pentecost after Jesus has ascended into glory? And why then did Jesus say in the Great Commission, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? Why would that be said if it were not important? So on the authority of the Word of God, I would present to you that baptism does matter in our day and in this generation. It's a matter of obedience. It does not save you, but it is very, very important. So are we being legalistic? You know, I've been accused of being legalistic sometimes. Anytime you take a stand that other people say, well, I'd rather compromise that. Because I take a stand, they say I'm legalistic. Well, some accuse me of being narrow-minded. Well, if they accuse me of being narrow-minded and I'm following the Scripture, then they're accusing God of being narrow-minded. And if I'm standing with God, I'm okay with that, all right? Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm okay with that. If you call God narrow-minded, you can call me narrow-minded. Because I'm going to try to share with you what the Word of God says. So are we being legalistic and narrow-minded to require that every person who joins this fellowship of believers must first have made a public profession of faith in Jesus and repentance of their repentance by being baptized? Folks, what I would say is we are simply being faithful to the Word of God. Simply being faithful to that. The messenger's method of preparing the way for the Lord was first of all through the preaching of baptism. A baptism of repentance. And then there was the practice of baptism. It says in verse 5, and all the country of Judea was going out to him. 
They were going out to him. They were going out to the wilderness where he was. They were going down so that they might be baptized. And all the people of Jerusalem, and that they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now confess, to confess is to agree with the statement that has been made about you. What John was saying to them was, you are sinners. You have sinned against a holy God. And you may be religious. You may consider yourself to be righteous in the world eyes, but you are sinners and you need to repent of that and turn from that. Well, when they came down to be baptized by him, they were confessing that that was true. Now, no proselyte could be baptized into Judaism until he had declared that he, had, that he forever had renounced all worship of idols, all pagan superstitions, and had promised an entire and unreserved submission to the law of Moses. Baptism was not an act to be followed without great seriousness about the step that was being taken. This was not something they did lightly. They didn't say, hey, looks like people are having a lot of fun. Look at that line of people going down to the water. There that man is dunking them in the water. That looks like fun. I've never had that happen in my life. So I think I'll join them and be there on the banks of the river and go down into that water. And Hey, that's neat. That's wonderful. That's an experience. No, it wasn't. John preached to them that matter of repentance, that they needed to turn from their sin. So today, as we know that our baptism is different from that of John. John was a baptism of repentance. Ours is a baptism not only, it, it only uh, meaning that we have turned from our sin, but also that we have turned to Jesus. That we testify by our baptism that we're being buried with Jesus by baptism into death and then raised to walk in a new life. And that is a glorious testimony. That is a wonderful testimony. So let us not make Christian baptism meaningless when it has such a serious background and was so serious at the time Jesus was on earth and those who identified with him, you know what they did? They were baptized. Now notice again that baptism was connected with the confession of sin. Now you know that there are three people to whom you need to make confession when you sin. One is you need to make confession to yourself. If you deny the fact, if you were to be one who says, wait a minute now, you're talking about sin. I've lived a pretty good life. Just ask my neighbor. Just ask, don't ask my wife, just ask my neighbor, just ask somebody else that observes me from the outside and you will find that I'm a pretty good fellow. Well, the first thing you need to do is to acknowledge the severity of your actions to yourself. No doubt when the prodigal son left home, he thought himself to be a fine and adventurous fellow. Before he could be restored to fellowship with his father, the Bible says that he had to come to his senses and admit, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. Now that brings up the second person to whom we need to confess. You need to confess to those people that you have wronged. It was appropriate that the prodigal son confess his wrongdoings to his earthly father as well as his heavenly father. Whenever you confess sin, that is proper. And thirdly, certainly, you need to confess to God. Someone has said that the end of pride is the beginning of forgiveness. The end of pride is the beginning of forgiveness. You know, when a person is baptized, that person is confessing personal sin, and that person is confessing Jesus' death as the payment for their sins. It is a serious act that pictures the admission that we were dead in sin, but through Jesus we've been raised to life. Oh, I want to tell you, that ought to be a joy. That ought to be a precious, precious joy that every person ought to look forward to with great anticipation that they can give God the glory in such a manner as that. Because every person is baptized, they are proclaiming the gospel. The good news that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. Notice with me, if you would, the messenger's manner. We see first his individuality in verse 6. It says, John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was was locust and wild honey. Well, why was it that John made such an impact on the people 
of his day. I'll tell you what it was. He was a man who lived his message. Not only his words, but his whole life was a protest against the sinful, indulgent lifestyle of the people of his day. Like the prophets of old, he lived as simple as possible. He avoided indulgence in the luxuries of the day. That was true in his clothing. That was true in his diet. You know, if you think long enough about John's diet of locust and wild honey, probably that growling of your stomach is going to change from one of hunger to one of nausea. I doubt there'll be many takers today. I would imagine that my grasshoppers I'll have to gather and take back to the house because none of us would want to live on the diet that John lived on. Now understand me. If I were to dress like John the Baptist, if I were to dine upon the same delicacies as John the Baptist, that would not make me a bit closer to God. However, if I yield myself completely to God as he did, what a difference that would make. If I'm willing to be so committed to God that it doesn't matter what others preach or what others practice, that I'm going to preach and practice New Testament Christianity, then I will certainly be closer to God. So men, I would say this to you. I would encourage you to each be an individual who gives yourself to God. Doesn't matter what the men around you do. It doesn't matter what they think a real man is. A real man, folks, is one who acknowledges that God is the one that makes a difference and is willing to stand upon the principles of the Word of God. Ladies, I would encourage you to each one be an individual. Be that godly woman adorned with that quiet submission to God. Be what God intends for you to be. Be one in love with the Lord and make it to where that you don't mind people knowing that you love the Lord Jesus Christ. I would encourage each of you to be individuals. Don't allow what others do to be your standard. Be willing to truly be an individual. His manner was that he was an individual who desired to please only God. But notice his insight. It says in verse 7, And he was preaching and saying, After me one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Holy Spirit. Now, where did John gain such insight as that? He gained it through learning the Word of God at the feet of his godly parents. He learned it through studying the Word of God himself during his time of isolation from society in the Judean wilderness. He learned it through opening his heart to the Holy Spirit of God in prayer. I see John, I see John as he goes out into the wilderness, and he's there all by himself, and he doesn't say, Oh me, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I didn't bring with me enough books to read. All I have is the Word of God. I didn't bring with me any entertainment. What am I going to do with my days? Oh, woe is me that I have to spend all of this time out here alone. No, he delighted in the fact he was walking with God. He delighted in the fact that his heart was open toward God. John, John understood the truth because he was open to the truth. He was open to the truth because he was wide open to God. And he was so open to God that his life was not about him. His life was about one who was coming after him. His life was about the Messiah. And he saw himself as not even being worthy to be the servant of the Messiah. He said of himself, I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. You see, John asked nothing for himself, but everything for Christ. For hundreds of years, there had been no voice of prophecy. People were hungry for an authentic word from God, and in John, they found that authentic word. What did John mean when he said, I baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit? Well, he had immersed them in water. When he did, when you baptize somebody by immersion, they are soaked head to toe with water. But Jesus would immerse them in the Holy Spirit. When you come to Jesus, you are soaked through and through with the Holy Spirit of God. Now remember that even though John preached about repentance, that was only preparatory to faith. His ministry to them would have meant nothing without the ministry of the Messiah. Folks, there are a lot of religions that will clean you up on the outside. All right? Only Jesus will clean you up on the inside. 
So what are we to do? How are we to respond? What are we to... Has God called us to be John the Baptist? He called us to go out into the wilderness and be out there crying about repentance, screaming top of our lungs that people need to repent? No. He's called us to be who He wants us to be. And we need to spend enough time with Him that we know what it is that God has called us to do and how we might be able to represent Him, what we might be able to do to follow Him, what we might be able to do to allow Him to be glorified in our lives. That's what we need to do. Wherever He tells you to glorify Him, glorify Him in that way. But I tell you, He will always glorify Himself through those who are willing to surrender to Him and let Him work in their lives. He says, he, he says I'll baptize you with water, but only He can baptize you, soak you through and through with the Holy Spirit of God. So this morning, as every Sunday morning, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to the Word of God. Now, you will respond. You will respond either positively or negatively. With John the Baptist, I want to point you to Christ. I don't ever want to point you to religion for religion's sake. I don't want to point you to church for the sake of the church. But I want to point you to the very Son of God who has come to give His life as payment for your sin. So the question is, are you willing to agree with God concerning your need of forgiveness? Are you willing to put all of your hope and all of your trust in Jesus? Are you willing to say to God, God, I've sinned against you and I stand in need of forgiveness? Today could be that day when you surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, if you've already done that, have you acknowledged that before people? One of the greatest places to acknowledge that is before a group of people that, that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've made that decision, you say, well, that's a private decision between me and God. Well, God never intended it to be. Are you ashamed of the Lord? Are you ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ? He hung on a cross for you. Or were you willing to stand before people and say, I have put my faith and trust in Jesus? Now, if you've never done that, I encourage you to do that even today. Have you identified with Him through the beautiful testimony of baptism? If not, you have failed to glorify Him through this powerful testimony of your faith in Him. This is the way that He said that we were to identify with Him publicly was through baptism. Will you come to request baptism this morning now? It is only open to those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus, so that's the first step, but then you need to declare your faith through baptism. Possibly you're here and God's shown you that He wants you to be a part of this local church. We want you to do that. We're going to have a membership class here in a moment, a discovery class so people can learn more about this church. But you know... That's just to be a voting member. You need to identify with the body of believers. You don't have to wait to take a class to do that. If you've been saved and you followed Him in baptism, then identify with His body, the local church. We're going to ask that you bow your heads, close your eyes. Our worship team's going to come and they're going to play music. But during that time... Ask God what He would have you to do. Open your heart to Him. Surrender your life to Him. What is it that He wanted you to hear in all that I have said this morning? And how will you respond to it? Today is the day of salvation. Scripture says tomorrow may be too late. Don't wait till tomorrow. Today, do what God is leading you to do.
Just as me.